Once upon a time, there was a man named Solomon who built a mighty temple. But before long, the people of Judah turned away from God and began to worship foreign gods and idols. One day, God allowed the Babylonians to attack Judah and destroy the whole city, including God's temple. The people of Judah remained in captivity until one day, God raised up the prophet Haggai to inspire the people to get back to work, saying, the time is now. Hey, it's so great to be with each of you today, whether you've gathered with us at Church Online or you've gathered in person. We're just so uh, thankful for each and every one of you. Uh, just so thankful that technology helps us meet in a season like this. It's, it's so important, especially as uh, dialbacks have started to affect uh, other areas of life. We're just so thankful that we still have the ability to gather like this and do so in a way that's safe. I just want to say to each of you, if you're gathering with us on Church Online, just thank you so much for allowing us the privilege of coming into uh, your home during this season. We're just thankful that technology helps fill in the space that physical distance has created. And if you've gathered with us uh, in person, I just want to say thank you so much for, for helping us stay open by, by working the regathering plans. You've, you've set aside some preferences. I think we all have in this season, but I want to say thank you for, for making the pivots, for making the changes, for pivoting to online services, if that's the best decision for you and your family. Our prayer has, has really just been this during this season, that even though physical distance has created uh, kind of an inordinate space between each of us, you know, there's, there's more space between us in the room, there's more space between us as we're watching church online and especially as we're rolling into the holiday season with the new dial backs and it's going to be a difficult season for most of us i do believe that um our prayer is simply that would be that god the holy spirit is working hard he is doing the good work of helping us stay spiritually connected during this season so i just want to say say thank you for that thanks for being church family thanks for being an amazing church family real life church we love you we love you so much we are uh uh, today in week three of our three-part series on the book of Haggai. I want to tell you more about that in just a minute. But next week, we begin our Advent season, our four-week Christmas series. And this year, our four-week Christmas series is simply called God with us. It's a perfect follow-up to a study on the book of Haggai. It's the, the promise that we look to as we celebrate Advent. Advent is all about the celebration, about uh, looking back to Christ's birth, but then also looking forward with expectation as for Jesus uh, coming for his church once again. And, and, you know, in a season like this, I think it's going to be a really, a really meaningful talk as we look at some of the places that we go in life where it seems like we're alone, where it feels like God maybe necessarily isn't with us. But we get to go to scripture and we get to look to see absolutely God is with us. And so next weekend, it's Thanksgiving weekend. It's the first weekend of Advent. We're going to start with a probably a little bit too on the nose message for this season, but we're going to talk about God with us even when we're apart. So I can't wait that we get to do that together next Sunday. That's November 29th. Excited for that. Today, we are in the final part of our three-part study of the book of Haggai. Well, who was Haggai? He was a he called a minor prophet. Doesn't mean he had a, a less important message. It just means that his writings were shorter. Haggai is a, a short two-chapter book tucked away there at the end of the, the Old Testament. Haggai was an Old Testament prophet, and this his writings were 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 written in 520 BC. And it's important to understand the role of a prophet. It's it's really easy for us to have sometimes have a wrong idea of what it means to be a prophet. I think for most of us, we hear the word prophet and we think about someone who is predicting future events. But, but biblically speaking, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, prophecy really is more about showing us that a, a, a biblical prophet's words were a call for repentance, for turning back, for putting trust back into God, turning back to God and his ways. And, and that's the story that we're stepping into here in Haggai. When Solomon was king, David helped establish the the the, the 
the worship in Jerusalem. Solomon, his son, built this amazing temple. He completed the temple in Jerusalem. It was really the crowning achievement of the Jewish people of the day. It was the center of religious and, and social activity. I mean, it was the most important structure for them. It housed the presence of the people of God as you walk through the, the, the temple courtyards and into the temple building itself, into the Holy of Holies where the, the Ark of the Covenant, that literally it's called the mercy seat. It was where the, the, the physical presence of God would come and descend once a year to meet with the high priest and, and meet with the Jewish people. But as we read the, the big story of, of God's people, as they often did, even though they had the, the physical presence of God, this amazing structure, they, they turned away from God and they began living like everyone else around them. And for most of the story, especially in the Old Testament, that meant turning away from God and turning toward a life of idolatry. And as a, as a, a, a way to get his people's attention, um, in 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The nation of Judah, the nation of Israel, the two kingdoms of the Jewish people were, were captive. They, they were taken captive. They were hauled off to live in exile in the nation of Babylon. And after about 50 years of captivity, there were some, some changes that happened in the, the rulership in Babylon. It went from uh, Babylon to Persia to Assyria. But a small group of people, we call, they'll call them the remnant, a small group of people, about 50,000 people were allowed to return back to the area of Judea. And they started rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. They get to begin the work of rebuilding the temple. They started with the, with the altar space. It was the, one of the most important things. They restarted the, the sacrificial system and celebrating all of the feasts. But the story for those people, it's amazing that they were able to go back, but the story for those people, just like for centuries, God's people turned away. They got discouraged. Opposition from neighboring people groups came, and in, instead of pressing on, they, they took the resources that were meant for rebuilding the temple, and they put them to work rebuilding their own homes. They stopped the work that God had asked them to do. They got their priorities out of alignment. And this is the story that we're stepping into in the book of Haggai. In week one, we walked through most of the first chapter of Haggai. And we saw him, this Old Testament prophet, call his people back. It wasn't about predicting future events. It was about calling people back to a life of following God. And we saw it this way. We, 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 we wound up saying it this way, took this home with us. It was, we're going to do what's right, even when it's hard. And what we saw was God giving him, giving his instructions to his people of just simply do the work. I asked you to do something. I'm asking you to return and do the work. He said, go up the mountain and bring down the timber and rebuild the temple. They started work again. There was some enthusiasm around that. But after about a month, they stopped. The people were discouraged. We saw a discouragement set in from a lack of progress. We saw discouragement set in because of comparisons that were happening. We saw discouragement set in from just fatigue. And once again, we saw there in chapter two, Haggai calling them back, that they needed to persevere, that they could press on in obedience, not because they just had to, had to you know, pull themselves up by the bootstraps and do the work. No, they could persevere in their obedience because God was with them. And today, as we come to the end of the book of Haggai, we're going to see some new connections being made to faithfully do what God is asking us to do. And the title for our message today is simply this, Obedience and Blessing. Let's go to Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read uh, just a few verses to get us started here. Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priest what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person is defiled by contact with a dead body and touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest says, it becomes defiled. 
Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Let's just pray over our time in God's word today. Lord, thanks so much for the ability to gather. Uh, no matter where we are, whether we're home, uh, whether we're in person, no matter where we are, your presence is right there with us. And so as we turn to your word, we're looking for you to lead us. We're looking for you to guide us. Holy Spirit, we just simply submit to you and ask you to have your way. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for reading God's word with me this morning. On the surface, there seems like this is a conversation that's right out of the blue. Why in the world would Haggai uh, move his conversation from talking about uh, rebuilding God's temple? It was a conversation about a building project to all of a sudden talking about food and cleanliness. And, and the important part with Haggai's message and really with, with any prophecy, we have to understand the context. Context is king. Context is king. And here... Context is all about the date and the event of what's happening right here in Haggai. Each week we've seen a verse refer to a specific day and month. Just like we just read out of the, the New International Version, we see you know it's the sixth day of the sixth month of the second year of King Darius. The, I love the New Living Translation because I love the readability factor for it without losing the meaning. The New Living Translation has done the work and given us modern uh, month and day annotations so we can understand the timeline much more easily. We looked at a little bit that, of this last week, but I want to show it to you again here this morning. Haggai 1.1, 1, 1, we're look, talking about August 29th, 520 BC. I mean, it's, it's that specific in the writing. Haggai 1.15, September 21st, 520 B.C. Haggai 2.1, another month has passed. It's now October 17th, 520 B.C. And then here in verse 10, we've now moved two months farther down the road. It's Haggai 2.10, is December 18th of 520 B.C. So a couple of months have passed. Work has continued on the temple. So, so what's the event? Why is Haggai calling the priests and the people here at the temple. Well, each of the previous messages that we've had, there's basically four discourses that happen in the book of Haggai. Each of the, pre the two previous messages that we looked at were focused on rebuilding, but they were really closely tied to the religious festivals that were happening uh, there that would have happened at the temple should it have been completed. But what's happening here is a ceremony at the temple, but it's not connected to one of the religious feasts. And we had to look at some extra biblical writing. We had to understand the, the, the culture of Mesopotamia at that time in order to understand what's happening here. What's happening, it's a dedication ceremony for the completion of the foundation of the temple. While it's still incomplete, an important milestone was being celebrated. It's the completion of the foundation. This celebration coincides with the three-month anniversary of work resuming. And in, in the culture of Mesopotamia at the time, this ceremony would have been just as important as a groundbreaking ceremony or a cornerstone ceremony would be for us today. So they're marking the occasion, and then Haggai has a message from God for the people. So this is at an this the context is it's an important ceremony celebrating the progress, a time of coming together as the people, looking forwards as well as reflecting and looking back. And the Lord has a powerful word for them about what it means to be his people. And the word is a common word that we see all throughout the story of scripture that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. What had happened to God's people? Even the people here in Jerusalem in 520 BC, the story was the disobedience of idolatry. The story was disobedience of, of stopping work. The, the idol of self took over. Instead of taking the, the resources that were set aside, that were dedicated to rebuilding God's temple, they took those resources when opposition came and they reprioritized their life and put those resources to work in building their own homes. 
kind of the, the long view of scripture is really this. God's people seemingly always turn towards something else rather than turning toward God. They look around them and they want to be like others. They, they want to become, they compare themselves to the people around them. You know, especially in the Old Testament, God's intention for the people of Israel was to lead them directly. You go all the way back to uh, Genesis uh, 2 and Genesis 3, the story happening in the garden, there was perfect fellowship between Adam, Eve, Adam and Eve and God. Sin broke that relationship, and then all throughout the story of Scripture, we see God trying to restore his people, trying to restore that relationship. But they compare themselves to other people, and they want what other people have. God wants to lead them directly. And when he set up the system of, of judges to lead the people, what did they say? No, we want a king. We want a king. And it set the, the nation of Israel. It splits the kingdom into two different kingdoms. It led them on a path. God's people turned to idols, and those idols were both literal. We see that all the time in Scripture, God's people turning toward literal idols to be just like everybody else around them, but also the idol of self, and that's what we're seeing here, the idol of selfishness, the idol of disobedience, the, the idol of, well, I know better than what God is telling me to do, so I'm going to do what I want to do. So it's an interesting conversation that Haggai has here with, with the priests. Uh, pick up back again in verse 12. I'm going to switch over to the New Living Translation because I like the readability here in this section of Scripture just a little bit better. Haggai 2.12. Uh, if one of you is carrying some meat from a holy sacrifice in his robes and his robe happens to brush against some bread or stew, wine or olive oil or any other kind of food, will it also become holy? And the, the priest's answer, no. It was an important conversation, this uh, uh, idea of ceremonial cleanliness or uncleanliness, holiness or unholiness. It was an important piece of daily life, especially for these priests. Verse 13, if someone becomes ceremonially unclean by touching a dead person and then touches any of these foods, will the food be defiled? And the priests answered, yes. Then Haggai responded, this is how it is with this people and this nation. Remember, we've seen this, this change a couple different times. In chapter 1, we saw God talk about the people of Israel, those people that refused to do the work. And then they restarted the work, and he called them the remnant. He called them my people. And here again, he's kind of addressing them in, a, in another negative way of saying these people, those people, again, this people. That's how it is with this people and this nation. Listen to this line. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Well, why this conversation? Why talk about food? Well, this is a, a practical example of a deep spiritual conversation. God, through Haggai, is telling the people that, that what they do matters, that what they do has a spiritual consequence, that what they do that their sin, their sin of selfishness, their sin of stopping the work, their sin of idolatry of self, it corrupts everything that they do. They returned to Jerusalem. They started work on the temple. They, re they began by, by rebuilding, by reconstructing the altar. And it was so important. That was one of the most important spots as uh, you know, the sacrificial system, which we don't really understand. Um, we don't understand the importance of that because we're living under the sacrifice of the cross, but that altar space was the, the the most important thing. That's why they started rebuilding with that structure. But their sin of self was obe disobedience to God, and it rendered all of their sacrifices at that altar unacceptable to God. Their sin tainted their gift. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Sin spreads easier than holiness. I've said it this way uh, many times. We don't drift towards health. We don't just, you know, the path of least resistance is not one to health. It's not the path of least resistance is not the path to holiness. Sin spreads easier than holiness. When our hearts aren't right with God, when our attitudes don't line up, whatever we wind up doing is tainted. We can do all of the right things. But if we do all of the right things with the wrong motives, or say it this way, if we honor God with our words, but not our actions and attitudes, Jesus says that our hearts are far from him. 
the first part of, of Haggai's message to the people at this celebration, it actually echoes all the way back to Saul, their first king. The prophet Nathan, it winds up rebuking Saul for his attitude. Saul has this, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's a really conflicted character in scripture. He's God's chosen. He's God's anointed person. The first king that God, the, the Holy Spirit descends on Samuel and descends on Saul. And he is anointed king. He's God's chosen person. Second choice, because God wanted to lead the people himself, right? He's God's chosen person to lead the nation of Israel. And Saul winds up becoming this conflicted character where he becomes so prideful of all of the things he's done. I mean, he's he's chest thumping in this section of scripture. I've defeated all the people. I've done all of the things. I've, I, you know, it's just this lit, litany of self-aggrandizement. Look at everything I've done for you. And Samuel says this, look at 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? He says, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. Listen to this. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. For Haggai and the people of Israel in Jerusalem in 520 BC, God wanted more than a nice temple rebuilt in his name. He wanted his name in the hearts and on the mind of his people. He wanted his people to have the right kind of posture. And it's a posture that we can so easily twist around that our posture with God becomes transactional rather than relational. Have you ever fallen into that trap where your your relationship with God is based on, well, I've done the things, I've I've followed the rules, I've I've, you know, I've I've done all of these different things. Jesus confronted that in some people that were following him. He says, you know, we've driven out demons. We've done, we've healed people. We've done, the, we've raised the dead. We've healed the sick. We've done all of these amazing things. And Jesus says, well, your hearts were so from me. I'll wind up saying to you, I, I never knew you. And that, that scripture, that really, honestly, it haunts me. It helps me stay in check. It helps me stay connected. It helps me stay with the right kind of posture of, well, I want my relationship with Jesus to be tr uh, to be relational, not transactional. And there's an important scripture as John's talking with his as as Jesus is talking with his disciples uh, at the Last Supper. It's John chapter 14, verse 15. And this comma is a really important comma in this in this scripture. Jesus says to his disciples, "If you love me, obey my commandments." And we can so easily take that comma out or we can rearrange things and we can wind up putting performance on our, even though when I talk about obedience, it's really easy to think about this in terms of performance rather than a heart posture. If you love me, obey my commandments. It's, it's, we can so easily twist that into a, you have to, you have to do this. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you're going to obey my commandments. You're going to do what I'm asking you to do. If, if you love me, this is just going to flow from the, the, it's going to come out from the overflow of your heart. Obedience to what I'm asking you to do is going to come from an overflow of our relationship, not just a list of all the things you have to do. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Maybe say it this way to help connect it for us a little bit better. We don't obey to be blessed. We obey because we love. We don't obey to be blessed. We obey because we love. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And the answer is why? Because God wants our hearts. Let's pick up Haggai. Let's keep moving in chapter two here. Let's see what God's reminder is to his people. Verse 15, look at what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for a 20 bushel crop, you only harvested 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. This is God saying this to the people, I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refuse to return to me, says the Lord. 
it's so easy to look at a scripture like this and say, why in the world is God punishing his people? It's really easy to say that. But all throughout the story of scripture, God isn't a God about, of punishment. He's a God of restoration. God is hard at work to bring people back to himself. So even though we see opposition like this in a scripture like this, it's not about punishment. God's intention isn't to punish, it's to restore. In this section of scripture, God is telling his people, listen, I made things harder because I wanted you to turn back to me. So doing what's right, even when it's hard, it really tracks with this. Even when things get difficult, we're still gonna turn toward God because that's the right thing to do because God wants to have our hearts. I, I try to live by this axiom. It's a hard, th a hard one to live up to. Right feelings follow right decisions. Sometimes doing what's right or being obedient is uncomfortable. Can I just say it? Well, I just did. Sometimes doing what's right or being obedient, it's something that maybe I don't want to do, or maybe it's something that I, I don't like, or maybe it's just something that isn't comfortable. But I really believe that right feelings will follow right decisions. My, my own story I, really reflects this. There was a season when I was younger. I was still in Bible college. I was volunteering at, at church. But I was removed from ministry because of attitude and behavior issues. I, I mean, I was, I was doing basically all of the things. That story of, you, you know, you've done all these things in my name. I was leading worship. I was leading Bible studies. I was serving consistently. But at the same time, my, my heart wasn't connected. God didn't have my heart. I was just doing the sacrifice, but I wasn't walking out of obedience where God had my heart. So I was living this dual life. And... I get confronted about it and then I get removed from ministry. I was so angry. I was so angry. I was angry I was at my pastor. I was angry at the circumstances. I was angry at getting caught. I was, I was angry at Beth. I was angry at God. I was confronted about my, my sinfulness and I had a choice. I was given a choice in that moment. Do what's right or do what I wanted to do, which can I just say it? Honestly, in the moment, I knew that it was destructive. I knew my choices were destructive. It was destructive to me personally, it was destructive to my ministry, and most importantly, it was destructive to my family. So I made the hard right choice. I mean, I'm sitting here and I didn't want to do it. It didn't feel right, but I knew the right choice was I had to close the door on my old life and my old friends. I had to end those relationships. I had to close the door on the on the past and move forward and do what was right. So I made the hard right choice. And can I say it this way? I wrestled with God for 18 months over that decision. 18 months, I would go to church and I would leave angry. I would go to church and I didn't feel connected to God's presence. I would go to the Bible studies. I would do all of the things. But it was an 18-month wrestling match with God. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? But I knew I had to make the hard, right choice. Can I say this? I wouldn't change a thing about that. I wouldn't change a thing about that because obedience shaped me. It changed me. It reformed me from the inside out. God did a miraculous work in me, not because I had right feelings about the decision at the front end, but because I was obedient and made the right decision. God wanted my heart, but it started with making the right decision, not feeling the right feelings. God wanted me to put him first in every area of my life. First in my marriage, first in my ministry, first in my recreation. I mean, all of the things God wanted to be first. So I had to make the right, hard choice. God wants our hearts. Obedience is better than sacrifice because God wants our hearts. And that's the message here from God to his people in Haggai. He's not punishing them. He's not saying, I sent the blight and the hail and all of the things and everything that you tried to do, I, I, I put my hand on it and, and withheld some blessings from you. He's not punishing them. He's drawing them close, trying to get their attention to turn them back to himself. So look at verse 18. Think about this 18th day of December 
the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. That, that line right there, we've seen that so many times in the book of Haggai. Think carefully. What did we see in, in the, the, the NIV version? Give careful consideration to your ways. There's that phrase. Think about it. Think carefully. Now listen to what God says. Verse 19. I am giving you a promise now while seed is still in the barn. So harvest is over. It's the winter. They haven't planted because it's not spring yet. Okay? I'm giving you a promise now while seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain, your grapevines, figs, pomegranates, and olive oils have not yet produced their crops. But from this day forward, I will bless you. The beauty from God in this statement, all about relationship, about God having our hearts, about obedience being sacrificed, is right there in that last line, from this day forward. The, the, mag, the, the message of Haggai is really a Cliff Notes version of the big story of God. It's past curse leads to future blessing through present obedience. I want to say that one more time. I want that to sink in. Past curse leads to future blessing through present obedience. Seed is still in the barn. You haven't even done the work yet. You haven't harvested what's coming next harvest season. But from this day, this present obedience, from you completing the, the foundation of this temple, here at this dedication ceremony, I'm telling you, people of, of Jerusalem, from this day onward, because you've done what I've asked you to do, because you've walked out present obedience, I'm going to remove the past curse, and I'm going to bless your future because of what you're doing right now. No matter what's happened in the past, God rewrites your future because of what Jesus has already done for you. And it starts with simple obedience right now. Right now. The message of Haggai is a microcosm. It's a, it's a two-chapter retelling of the entire story of God's people. What does God do? God works to draw his people back. Sometimes he has to, to make things difficult so people turn back to him. God's people drift away. They, they get their priorities out of whack and God calls his people back. How many times have we seen this play out in our own lives? We make decisions to follow Jesus and yet something will come up and will pull our attention away from him and he leads us back. It's why this, in this season with this, what did Scott Hagen call it? The Bermuda Triangle of all of the things we've been dealing with here in 2020. The time is right now. This is a perfectly timed message from 2,500 years ago that can directly speak into our situation. Think about it. 2,500 years ago, 520 BC to 2020 AD. Isn't that fascinating? This scripture is still calling God's people back to him. No matter what's happened in the past, past curse leads to future blessing. God is going to rewrite your future because of what Jesus has done for you. And it starts with present obedience. So as God's people, people that he's chosen, that he's called, that he's drawn close to him, we're going to do what's right, even when it's hard. We're going to persevere. We're going to keep going. We're going to obey. We're not going to let discouragement or comparison or even obedience fatigue set in to pull us away from what God wants to do. Because even when we fall or even when we mess up, we can return to obedience because we're God's people. It's our story. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And God has our hearts, not just our actions. It's a beautiful story. And that's the story of Haggai. The time is now. So Father, today we just want to say thank you so much for these amazing words that that. 2,500 years ago, you had this message for God's people then and this message for God's people now. And so we are just so thankful that you rewrite the story of our past and you are reshaping the story of our future because of our present obedience. And so we just, in this moment, we turn back to you. 
the idol the idolatry of self, the idolatry of of all of the different things that have taken us over in in 2020. We want to to lower the story of those things and put you back in your proper place, as first in our lives, and we make that our prayer this morning. So friends, as we as we wrap up this time together here today, I've just had this stirring in my heart for the last several months. This has been a really hard year, and yes, that's the that's the cap and obvious statement of the day. Um, I read this story. I look at this. I just I knew we needed to have this conversation out of Haggai, and it, it's such an appropriate spot on message. You know, we're constantly when we're looking at prophecy, we're trying to discern well what was specific to them, and and what are the concepts that we can apply to our own lives. And I think each week we've seen uh, building week for week for week during the time is now that we've seen that you know we can we can return back to being God's people. Um, by doing the things that he's asked us to do. And so I've been looking for a tangible thing. You know, th this year, all of the things that clamor for our attention, and, and I'll, I'll even say it this way, we've had a lot of things that have been really divisive uh, in our world. Um, it's trickled into the, the global church. It's even sometimes trickled into, into our church family. But I've just had this sense, just like rebuilding this temple uh, for the people of Jerusalem in 520 was so monumentally unifying as a people. I mean, it set the, it set the trajectory for everything to happen in the New Testament. I, I truly believe that we have the opportunity as a church family, can I say it that way? We have the opportunity as a church family to come around and rally around something here as we wrap up 2020 as we look forward to celebrating Christmas it's it's one of our favorite times of the year we're going to celebrate and it's going to be different obviously in this season um, but I've really had this sense that we need to have something unifying to put in front of us that we can uh, be obedient that we, our obedience can be better than our sacrifice and so I'm calling our church family to a, a miracle offering give day. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's been several months. It's been even longer than uh, several months where we, you know, we rallied around to help launch Bluffs Community Church. And, you know, in seasons like this and just like the people of Israel here in the story of Haggai, it, it, it can be so easy for us in seasons of division or seasons when circumstances are really hard to be focused on ourselves. And one of the things that we're so thankful for is that as a church family, we, you know, all, the needs of the house, can I say it that way, talking about, you know, real life church, the needs of the house, ministry is happening, you know, uh, your generosity has been amazing to provide uh, for all of the operations and everything of the church. But I want us to really step into, uh, in, 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 a, in a big way, in a big miraculous way, step into our calling of what does it mean to be you know, a, a church that's focused on reaching people around us. We talked about this um, even during our, our previous series. We were talking about what does it mean to be a Jesus-centered, others-focused, mission-minded church. And so here's what I'm asking you to do. On December 20th, so that's four weeks from today, December 20th, we are going to have a, a, a moment, a, a miracle offering moment. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to give, but this is what we're going to, we're going to do as a church family. We are going to have a miracle offering where every single penny of that offering is going to go right back out the doors and help partner with local ministry. And we're going to we're going to talk about some of those over the next several weeks as we keep putting this in front of us as we just kind of want to remind us and lead us toward that moment. We've got some amazing local ministry partners like Union Gospel Mission and uh, Together for Good and we want to come around these partners in a big way. We want to do something that's not about us taking care of our own needs but us taking helping and coming alongside and taking care of the needs of others. So here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to give, but I would love to. I just have this big, big audacious goal, this number that I feel like God dropped in my heart. Where what if we raised $50,000 as a church family uh, on Sunday, December 20th, and we were able to partner with uh, five local ministry groups at the level of $10,000 each? 
So here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to do the math, and I'm not asking you to give. But what I am asking you to give is to ask God, or what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to ask God what you need to do. I'm asking you to walk out obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we're going to talk about this over these next several months. I want you to circle that date. I want you to write that down, December 20th, uh, Go Local Miracle Offering. And uh, we'll talk more about that. I know the worship team is on their way back up to lead us in some worship. We're going to wrap up our service here in just a moment. Church family, Beth and I, we love you. Uh, tomorrow is our last day of quarantine. And so we get to be back out in public and can't wait to see you guys in person or on Church Online next week. Happy Thanksgiving. We love you. We're praying for you and can't wait to be with you soon.